In this section, we're going to cover both muscle tissue and nervous tissue. There are three types of muscle cells, cardiac, skeletal, and smooth. Skeletal muscle is the only one of those three that is voluntary. So I would recommend that you make a chart. And at the top of the chart, you make three columns, one that says skeletal, the other that says cardiac, and a third that says smooth. And then underneath each of those, you write the characteristics that we review. You will need to know these when we get to the muscular system. And you will need to know this information, particularly next semester, when we are talking about the heart, cardiovascular system, the GI tract, the respiratory tract, and the urinary tract. So make that chart and memorize this information so you have it with you in your brain always. The first characteristic is that skeletal muscle cells are voluntary. Cardiac muscle cells and smooth muscle cells are involuntary. In other words, you can't think, I'm going to make my heart beat, or I'm going to make material move out of my stomach into my small intestine. Skeletal muscle cells are also known as muscle fibers, and I will use those terms interchangeably going forward. They are multinucleated. They are striated. And if you take a look at the pictures that, we, that I have posted in this, you will see that there are bands of light, and dark and light and dark. Those are considered striations. And they are the reason that skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle contract so quickly and so well. Those striations are due to a very organized repetitive pattern of protein myofilaments, both actin and myosin. So right now we know that skeletal muscle cells are voluntary and multinucleated. It turns out that this is a nice to know, not a need to know. In the embryo, these long, thin muscle fibers, muscle cells, develop and then do not differentiate into smaller units. So you, have, you end up with a multinucleated cell. This is going to be important because of the fact that there are going to be many proteins created by those genes in those, do anybody remember? Nuclei, because of the genetic material. And that's what they look like. This is classically skeletal muscle. You can very clearly see the numerous nuclei, those, are those dark little dots that you can see. And you can also very clearly see the striations. Cardiac muscle <clears throat> looks vaguely similar to skeletal muscle because it is also striated, which means the theory is, is that they have a similar contraction mechanism. On the other hand, cardiac muscle cells are voluntary. They branch, and that branching is going to be important because it allows the heart to act like a functional syncytium, and that term is in the bottom sentence, the last sentence on this slide. And they also are uninucleated. In addition, they have what are known as intercalated discs, and those intercalated, a couple of those intercalated discs are marked by arrows at the top. Those intercalated discs are specialized structures that aid with anchoring in between cardiac muscle cells, and they will also contain specialized gap junctions, and we know that gap junctions are for intercellular communication. The fact that these intercalated discs aid with structure and intercellular, intercellular communication is another reason why the heart is able to act like a functional syncytium. So the characteristics of cardiac muscle cells, let's go over them, involuntary, striated, branching cells, single nucleus, mononucleated, and they have intercalated discs between the cells.
and this shows you a picture drawing of the things that you need to know about cardiac muscle cells. And that shows you a micrograph. You can pretty clearly see the intercalated discs and some of the branching as well as the striations and the single nuclei. Now, smooth muscle cells also find uh, forms of syncytia. They are spindle-shaped cells, and you can see a, an image of what a spindle-shaped cell looks like, fat in the middle and skinny at either end at the bottom of that picture. So they are spindle-shaped cells, and they are uninucleated or mononucleated. They lack striations, but do not put that down as a characteristic because if you were going to describe what I looked like, you wouldn't say she's not six feet tall and she's not five feet tall. You would say she's five, six. So something that is, you can't say the characteristic is not something. You would write down involuntary, single nucleus, spindle shaped cells. That shows you a drawing of what they look like when they're relaxed, and that shows you a drawing of what they look like when they are contracted. Now, to me, when I am looking at images of smooth muscle cells, they always remind me of schooling fish. So if you are a fan of oceano oceanography and you watch those shows on television, which show you all about the ocean and marine life, and you see fish schooling, that's what they remind me of, because it looks like that sort of pattern of movement, at least to me. Shows you the spindle-shaped cell outlined, shows you the single nucleus. I'm going to include nervous tissue on this section because we just have a couple of slides. We will be delving much more deeply into both neurons and neuroglia when we get to the nervous system, which is such fun. So let's give an overview of this now. This is yet another one of those slides that you pray you see on an assessment because once you see a neuron, you can't forget what a neuron looks like. Sometimes they're blue, sometimes they're purple, sometimes they're pink, but they are these big, beautiful cells with a lot of cellular extensions, which are known as processes. They are known as processes. So this is a neuron that happens to be a multipolar neuron if an arrow is pointing directly to the neuron, you will tell me it is a neuron on an assessment. If the arrow is pointing anywhere around that neuron and you are asked to identify the cell, you will tell me it is a neuroglial cell or neuroglia, which literally means nerve glue. These are the cells that are going to provide support and nutrition and anchoring for neurons. They are about 10 times as, 10 times as numerous as the neurons, neurons themselves. So do not make a mistake if you are lucky enough to get this, a slide like this on an assessment. If the arrow is on the neuron, that's what it is. If the arrow is anywhere else, it is a neuroglial cell. You will not be asked to identify individual neuroglial cells. You'll just call that a neuroglial cell as a category. So this shows you a little bit about what a neuron looks like and this is how sad all about an aging brain, which I have. We'll talk some of the, about some of the issues that go hand in hand with aging and um, cognitive dysfunction as we get into the nervous system. The image that is in the lower left shows you a multipolar neuron, which is what we saw in that last diagram. Multipolar neurons will have a long process that leads away from the cell, which is known as an axon. And at the distal end of that axon, you'll see something that is marked synaptic terminal. Sure enough, there's going to be little knobs on branches at the end of the axon. And that is where magic happens. And we have a 
synaptic cleft, and we pass information from cell to cell that way. Can't wait till we get to the nervous system. It's one of my favorites, but then they all are. And that, my friends, wraps up the histology portion. Google Images or Bing Images is your best friend throughout this section. Type in the name of the tissues that you have learned and look at as many images of each as you can. Do not just depend on the information posted in these PowerPoints. Go forth and Google or Bing.